Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Egg Whisper Show. I am so excited to have Dr. Shweta Nayak on today's show. Hi, Shweta. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us and being our expert on the do's and don'ts of how to get pregnant naturally. I'm sure like you, like me, <laughs> that sounds like a rhyme. Um, we get questioned all the time about when to have sex, how often to have sex, should we drink caffeine, should we not, alcohol, how much is too much. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, I want you to tell us about you. So my name is Shweta Nayak. I am a reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist. Um, I work at the Reproductive Medicine Institute, which is based in Chicago, Illinois, and the northern suburbs of Chicago. Awesome. And it's so hard to know who to trust, but people can trust us. I mean, when you go on Instagram, you see posts from really awesome, well-intentioned naturopaths and fertility coaches and acupuncturists, but you and I are gonna talk about the real deal on a lot of this stuff, right? That's right. Before I get into all those questions, I wanna know what made you go into medicine and why fertility medicine? So I chose to pursue a career in reproductive medicine because I really felt like it was the perfect intersection between cutting edge science, personalized medicine, and just this amazing opportunity to be part of uh, one of the most joyful journeys that a woman, a man, a couple takes in their lives towards building their family. When you're trying to get pregnant, probably the most important thing is to find out if your age matters. Tell us about fertility and age. So probably the single most important predictive factor for a pregnancy is age. And unfortunately, um, fertility declines with age in both men and women, although the effect is far more pronounced in women. If we look at relative fertility for a woman in her later 30s, it's about half that of what a woman in her early 20s would experience. Men also have lower fertility rates as they get older, but we don't see the effect really until they're about 45 or 50 years old. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about sex or a lot about sex. I get this question probably two to three times a day. How frequent should people be having sex? So um, reproductive efficiency certainly increases the more sex that we have. So uh, couples that have higher chances for conception per cycle are those couples that are just together far more often. Um, Generally speaking, having intercourse every day or every other day in the fertile window is the best uh, chance to get pregnant for that month. How about having sex multiple times a day? Having sex multiple times a day probably doesn't increase the chances for getting pregnant any more than having sex at the right times during the cycle in that reproductive window. You answer that much better than me. I usually say, I don't want to hear about it. Don't talk to me <laughs> about that. That's TMI. <laughs> Just kidding. There's no such thing as TMI with me, but literally like we get this question a lot. So I'm glad you answered it for us. Okay. So how do you know if you're even fertile and when you should be having sex? So the best clinical indicator that a woman is ovulating regularly is that she has regular cycles that are about every 21 to 35 days. Um, women that have shorter cycles or longer cycles really should seek consultation with their fertility specialist or OBGYN to try to figure out uh, what's the cause for the irregularity. There are other signs of ovulation. We call these malliminal symptoms that occur around the time of ovulation. Um, a very common one is something called middle schmerz, which is the um, feeling of cramping and discomfort just after that follicle releases at the egg. Um, other symptoms after ovulation include breast tenderness, maybe some pain, um, uh, mood changes, uh, water retention, um, sometimes changes in appetite. But all of these things are called malliminal symptoms relative to having ovulated. Um, there are other clinical symptoms that women might have that can indicate ovulation, and they can appreciate those things by examining cervical mucus. Um, for instance, cervical mucus does change uh, dependent on what estrogen levels are doing. And when estrogen levels are at their highest, cervical mucus is very slippery and clear. And if women um, have intercourse or couples have intercourse during that, that time where the cervical mucus has taken on this change, 
chances for conception are actually at its highest. So I have these patients that reach out to me and they're like, Dr. Amy, I have no egg white cervical mucus. I feel nothing related to ovulation that I read about. How else can I monitor it? What would you say? So I think using an objective measurement of ovulation outside of those clinical symptoms is really, really useful and very, very helpful. Um, probably the most popular way to objectively monitor when ovulation might happen is with a urinary ovulation predictor kit. So these are kits that you can pick up at your local grocery store or pharmacy, even order them on Amazon. Um, I always prefer the digital kits because it leaves very little to interpretation. Um, and so it's just a matter of uh, peeing on a stick and getting a readout to say when when would you be um, ovulating? And it's really important to remember that these kits are not telling you that you are, that you are ovulating at that moment, rather it's t predicting that you will be ovulating very soon. The majority of the time um, when you get a surge with these kits, most women will be ovulating within the next 24 to 36 hours, although a small number of women might ovulate up to 96 hours later. And now there's newer technology that's out there. Um, an example is the uh, AVA bracelet. So the AVA bracelet is a device that women can wear at night and it measures several different things, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, perfusion, and then um, also heart rate variability ratio. And the preliminary studies that looked at the AVA bracelet kind of correlated these changes in um, these uh, uh, measurements um, to different times in the menstrual cycle or different phases in the menstrual cycle. And they correlated then these changes with a very high 90% correlation with that uh, fertile window. Um, other devices that are used um, also utilize urinary LH and urinary hormones, but essentially digitize the information. So you pee on a stick, but you insert the information or upload the information into a device that then gives you output uh, real-time measurements of what that urinary LH looks like. So even more objective information um, about when you are surging and when might you be ovulating. There are so many tools out there. And I think what was really helpful that you just shared with us is that 24, 48, even 96 hours later. So sometimes even having sex three days after you think you've ovulated, that might still help you get pregnant. And another um, tool is the PROVE test. You mentioned the Aver bracelet. That's one test that can prove ovulation. And there's also this really cool ring, the Aura ring. I think it's O-U-R-A. That's very similar to the Aver bracelet and looks at many of the, the indicators that you just mentioned. Okay. Back to sex though, like how does position matter? Is doggy style better, missionary style, spooning? Like what's the best position to get pregnant? And this is such a common question, but truthfully, there's no one position that's more favorable than the other. And the reason that I tell all of my patients is that sperm is really modal. So just after intercourse or really just after ejaculation, sperm that's near the cervix um, can actually travel quite quickly through the cervix uterus into the tubes and can be found in the abdomen within two to 15 minutes of ejaculation. So, um, you know, whatever position works for the couple um, is what will work for getting pregnant. Exactly. I say the position that you enjoy the most is the one that's the best because honestly, we know from guys that are like totally stressed out in the collection room, if you're not enjoying it and no one enjoys putting sperm in a cup, you and I both know that from our experiences with patients and they can get stressed out and they have a really low count all of a sudden when they've had higher counts before, maybe collecting at home. So realize that there's no one position. Talking a little bit more about sex, let's talk about lubricants. When having sex, do they hurt sperm and are there any that are good? So water-based lubricants like Astroglide, KY Jelly actually can significantly affect sperm motility. And some studies have shown that sperm incubated in this um, in these types of lubricants, we can see relative reductions in motility by 60 to maybe even 100%. So in general, if a couple wants to use a lubricant, um, a safe one to use is pre-seed. Again, you can get that on Amazon. Um, other options, if pre-seed is not available, you know, canola oil, mineral oil seem to not really affect motility. Yeah, I think what people think is sometimes these pro-fertility marketed lubricants, they think it actually can improve fertility. But I tell people, just use it on the outside. It's not going to help the sperm. It doesn't do anything to get it anywhere faster. It just helps you enjoy sex. So you have a better experience. 
And you can certainly just go to your kitchen and find something for yourself too. What's the right. best fertility diet? Which, what do you recommend? So there's not a lot of um, data, unfortunately, that um, specific dietary variations might improve fertility. However, um, there is, this is a growing area of research. And more recently in the last several years, much more is known about certain types of diets in regards to outcomes with, let's say, IVF, which, are, which is our best type of fertility treatment. And so in general, when couples ask about diet, my best advice is to stick to something as close to a Mediterranean diet as possible. So that is whole foods, whole unprocessed foods, lots of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and really healthy fats, um, olive oil, and proteins coming from um, fish and lean meats uh, like chicken. Yeah, I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, and what about prenatal? Do you have one favorite prenatal that you recommend to your patients? You know, I, I recommend um, any prenatal vitamin that has at least 200 milligrams of DHA. I think that's the key. Uh, women's one a day has a great prenatal vitamin that has just this right amount. Great. How about smoking? How bad is it really for your fertility? So we know that smoking causes a lot of problems with our general medical health and well-being, and, and, and fertility is really no different. Um, in fact, folks who smoke have a two-fold higher risk for experiencing infertility, as well as a longer time to conception. For women, or in women who smoke, we can actually see that there is an acceleration in the loss of eggs. So women who smoke may have or may experience menopause on average one to four years earlier than expected for their ethnicity. And this is really important because the end of a woman's fertility is roughly a decade before she goes through menopause. So if we advance the age at which menopause occurs, we're then also advancing the age at which we might experience the end of fertility and then may also experience subfertility much earlier as well. And for men, it's no different. Uh, men who smoke, we can see really significant changes in seminal parameters, including lower counts, lower uh, numbers of sperm that have good progressive motility, and even higher uh, numbers of abnormally shaped sperm. And what about smoking marijuana or vaping? I mean, that, it's legal in almost most states now. And so most of our, a lot of our patients, not most, but a lot of our patients are doing it. Do you talk to your patients about that? And what advice do you give? So um, in general for vaping, I tell patients the same, although there's not a lot of data about vaping and fertility or fertility treatment outcomes, um, I still advise best practice to stop this uh, practice before trying to get pregnant or, and of course, when we're doing fertility treatment. And marijuana is the same. I think that, you know, in the upcoming years, um, now that it recreational use and medicinal use is um, legal in many, if not most states, um, that more research will be uh, made to see exactly what is the effect. But what do we know about marijuana right now? For men, um, we see that marijuana use, just smoking one cigarette, marijuana cigarette a week, might have a significant impact on seminal parameters, just like cigarette smoking does. So we can see an effect on motility, we can see higher numbers of abnormally shaped sperm. Although we don't know how this correlates with actual fertility or chances for pregnancy, these changes in seminal parameters are enough for me to advise uh, men who smoke marijuana to stop smoking while we're trying to conceive. And for women, um, there have been some studies that have shown that ever use, so women who have ever used marijuana or who are using during fertility treatment may experience higher chances for early pregnancy loss uh, compared to women who have never used marijuana or who, are, who were not using marijuana at the time of their fertility treatments. Thank you for that. And what about alcohol? As, does alcohol consumption affect our fertility chances or pregnancy rates? So alcohol does increase the time to conception, and we also see that folks that drink more than two drinks a day have a 60% higher chance for experiencing infertility. Um, in general, there's no safe amount of alcohol to consume when we're trying to get pregnant, and certainly once we're pregnant, we advise to not drink any alcohol at all, but is there a magic number? Um, some studies have tried to look at what that magic number might look like when folks are doing IVF. And um, what those studies have shown, what several studies have shown is that uh, the magic number might be somewhere around 50 grams. 
Um, so couples that drink more than or consume more than 50 grams of alcohol when doing fertility treatment have a lower chance and about a 20% lower chance for pregnancy compared to couples who drink fewer than 50 grams a week uh, when doing fertility treatment or when preparing for fertility treatment. So what does that mean? What is 50 grams? So a uh, four ounce glass of red wine or white wine is roughly 12 and a half grams of alcohol. Um, a 12 ounce uh, glass of beer is about 14 to 15 grams of alcohol and a one and a half uh, ounce glass of um, a hard liquor, vodka, gin, tequila is also about 14 to 15 grams of alcohol. So in general, 50 grams is equivalent to four drinks or fewer. So I can have 50 grams a day or 50 grams a week? 50, 50 grams a week. Okay. I mean, that's basically what what I tell my patients too, four servings per week. And a serving is an entire bottle of wine in your glass. It's literally four ounces and that's not that exciting. For some people, it's really hard to stop at four ounces, don't you think? So yeah. it might be better for them to stop altogether. But if you're someone who can have a beer and stop, then you know, drinking in moderation, our definition of moderation is going to be safe. So what about coffee? How do you advise your patients about that? I mean, I have three cups of coffee right now on my desk here. And so please don't take my coffee away. But what do you tell your patients? So in general, what I tell my patients is moderate consumption of caffeine, like one to two cups of coffee a day, um, doesn't appear to affect fertility or really increase risks once pregnant. So uh, one to two cups, and by the way, that's one to two eight ounce cups of coffee, not a big venti, double shot, espresso, uh, Starbucks order, um, is pretty safe. Um, some studies have shown that consuming more than 500 milligrams a day of caffeine might increase the chances for um, experiencing fertility, um, while others have shown that uh, consuming more than 200 milligrams a day might increase the chances for early pregnancy loss. So the magic number here is one to two, no more than two cups of, eight ounce cups of coffee a day. Yeah, I, I basically say the same thing. And then in pregnancy, your heart rate goes up, you have problems sleeping. So sometimes even a decaf can keep you up. Um, so transitioning to half calf, half decaf is something that you can also consider doing. I totally agree. So thank you, Shweta, for coming on today's show and talking to us about the do's and don'ts of getting pregnant naturally. I hope everyone who's listening learns so much. And I absolutely love the fact that you came on and get to know you even better. There was something on your website though, that just moved me so much. And that was something about what inspires you as a fertility doctor. Can you share that with us? Um, so my patients truly are what inspire me every day. Their strength and resilience is really what keeps me going and um, what keeps me going to fight for them and for their families. And I'm always so honored and, and really just humbled to be part of their journey. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you so much for coming on today's show. Is there anything else you want to share with our listeners before we sign off? To everyone on their journey to building a family, hang in there. Um, dig your feet in. It will happen. Uh, and I'm here with you. I'm rooting for you and wishing you all the best. I totally love that. So where can patients find you? Tell us about all your Instagram handles, all that kind of stuff. So um, you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Shweta Nayak um, with Dr. Shweta Nayak. Um, but you can also find me on uh, our practices website. So uh, again, I work at the Reproductive Medicine Institute and our website is www.teamrmi.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I hope you'll join us for a fertility Q&A soon. Will you? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll schedule that ASAP. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Shweta. Thanks again for coming thank on. Thank you. And thank you to all you listeners out there. Please go to eggwhisperschool.com if you haven't signed up for the tissue class or the IVF class. And please subscribe to my YouTube show. See you guys soon. Bye-bye. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 